Gateway to Crypto. Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I'm Udayan Mukherjee. These are difficult days for Indian digital companies, uh, startups particularly, because while once raising hundreds of millions of dollars was just about a month's game, the whole landscape of funding has changed. Now there is a pronounced drought in venture capital and private equity funding and Indian digital companies are struggling. Not a week goes by without news of thousands of layoffs in some of these companies. But this predicament does not apply to all companies. For example, Zoho Corp is one of these companies who've never raised venture capital or private equity capital and therefore is not struggling or reeling like some of its counterparts uh, in the digital universe. Uh, in fact, so much so that I like to call the founder of Zoho the ultimate bootstrap billionaire because he has is really a model of bootstrapping in that in that world. So it's wonderful to welcome Sridhar Vembu, who's the co-founder and CEO of Zoho Corp to the Business Today show. Sridhar, good to see you in today and thank you very much for joining in. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, I'm stay. You know, uh, in my introduction, I was just uh, outline, outlining how difficult it has become for the digital universe. But you've always stayed away from venture capital funding and private equity funding uh, much before the difficult times arrived. Uh, why is it? I mean, was it an article of faith for you that you will build your company up from scratch without recourse to external capital? What made you stay away? Yeah, so our uh, 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 this from you know early days, twenty five years, twenty seven years now, uh, wanted to avoid venture capital because I wanted to build a company for the long haul with uh, uh, really a you know focus on our freedom to to be ourselves. Really, that was the reason. There wasn't any very deep reason, but I felt that if we took venture capital, we would have to provide an exit eventually which would have to be an acquisition, in which case we lose our independence, or go public, in which case, again, we would lose our independence of free, so of execution. So I felt that being private would uh, give us the freedom. And, and what do I mean by the freedom? Freedom to invest in very long-term r and A lot of the things we do are focused on the long-term. And for example, there are products that invest, we invested uh, 12, 13 years ago, which are paying off now. It's very difficult to do when you have venture capital uh, or, or even public markets breathing down your neck because quarter to quarter profitability become very important. So that's why we uh, decided to, to essentially stay private indefinitely, which can only be possible if you don't raise external money. No, I, I take your point and it's a very important point that you make. But was it also in a way to do with the fact that you foresaw that reliance on external capital might actually warp the business model of your company in a way that will not that you'll not be able to focus on profitability on an annual basis to drive the company forward, which is what a lot of digital companies seem to be trapped in today. Did you foresee that problem too? Yeah, it was clear, you know, even in 99, 2000, there was a dot-com bubble, which was, uh, you know, a lot of companies that raised huge rounds of money then. Those are not huge rounds now. Uh, then fell by the wayside in 2001, 2, and then there was a big drought in VC funding for a while. That was a, a good lesson watching this in real time then. And uh, it also emphasized that you, you know, you, if you first, you know, the, if you raise money, you're forced to spend it and you lose profitability. And then when you really, uh, you know, when the winter arrives, money is no longer available and you're losing money. And... Uh, so we decided, you know, we will uh, do it profitably, and that necessarily meant growth would be slower, but it's steadier. And we have actually grown steadily over the last few years. Now we have crossed a billion dollar in uh, revenue, and we are now accelerating. Uh, the reason for the acceleration is now we have the depth and breadth of product portfolio, which we could not have built up if we had raised money because that long-term investment was not possible. And so you are, you know, in a, in a sense. Uh, what venture capital forces it to grow faster by investing more heavily in sales and marketing as opposed to R&D. And sales and marketing will give you an immediate boost uh, in growth. But if you don't invest enough in R&D, you don't have long-term growth. So that's the trade-off we were able to make, long-term growth versus uh, more immediate growth. 
Yeah, speaking of profitability, Sridhar, how profitable is Zoho Corp? Because you're a private company, there's not so much information in the public domain. I mean, we know that you've crossed the milestone of $1 billion in revenues and it's a significant milestone. But on that billion dollar revenue, could you give us some sense of what your profitability metrics are like? Yeah, we file our uh, report every year with the Indian government. So, and then we pay taxes. Our taxes would give you an idea of the profitability. Last year, we paid uh, over 600 plus crores in uh, uh, taxes. So, that gives you an idea. And so, we've been uh, consistently profitable uh, for yeah, uh, several years now, decades. And uh, that also is steadily growing. But we are reinvesting that profit back into R&D, back into our expansion, data centers, all of that, and uh, geographic expansion around the world, all of that. Now, this desire to stay private, does it extend to public shareholders as well? I'm, I'm not talking about venture capital or uh, any institutional kind of shareholding like private equity. But is there a desire to do an IPO and to share Zoho's success with public shareholders at large at any stage? No, I actually prefer to stay private because even public companies are subject to that quarter-to-quarter -quarter pressure still. And uh, and I also, as an example, you know, there is uh, three, four years ago this happened where profit declined 50%. And it declined simply because we invested more heavily in uh, R&D the time and more heavily in data center expansion, all that. And somebody actually, a journalist, pointed this out because they got this... Uh, uh, from the government filings that your profit had claimed. person, I said, uh, well, yeah, but I didn't pay attention to it because our concern is now we are investing in a lot of areas of growth. I couldn't be so nonchalant if I were a public company CEO. I would love to defend this, why we are doing this at the expense of profitability. Today, I, you know, we, we just do it if there is, a, there is a good opportunity to invest. But you don't see the need for uh, augmenting or do you, you don't consider the valuation of your company that important then? Or even if only as a currency for things like stock options, etc. Uh, I'm not even sure what the valuation of Zoho now. I mean, you have some peers like HubSpot, which would lend itself to some kind of market value or market cap comparisons. But could you share with us, A, what your likely valuation today is and whether you Valuation is important in your eyes at all? I truly don't care about valuation. I have not actually paid attention to that at all. Uh, you know, the press may write about the valuation, but I have never uh, computed it. I haven't cared about it. What matters is, do we have enough resources to invest in the areas we are investing in, all the R&D we're investing in? Are we growing steadily? And uh, do those products... Uh, come to fruition uh, around the morning we are investing in. Do we keep our employees happy? Uh, do we take care of them well? Do we keep our customers happy? Those are the concerns I have. And that's a, I, I consider that a, a luxury we can afford because we are private. And uh, that's, uh, no, essentially I get to ignore our shareholders, <laughs> which is something that most CEOs would love to do, but they cannot do, that I can afford to do. And if I go public, I cannot do this. There will be a, you know, I love to report to shareholders every quarter, and that's not something I I want to take on that burden. So that's why we are we are this way. And the valuation is something that uh, I've never paid attention. I know. See again, this is the wrong way to think. I mean, if I said this as a as a venture capital company or a public company, I would I would not have my job anymore. But that's that's why we stay private. Yeah, you have the luxury of doing that. But do you think that is really the core of or one of the core problems that is affecting the uh, digital universe in India today, that they put the cart before the horse, they thought of valuations before growing the business, and which is why all these problems are coming up with these newly coined uh, unicorns uh, over the last few months? Absolutely. I mean, take the word unicorn itself. That's considered a billion dollar in valuation. But as we saw, uh, you know, that valuation could come and go easily, could evaporate. I mean, we saw FTX, a company worth what, you know, 32 billion vanish into zero. Just the last couple of weeks, the crypto trading company, FTX. So what was, the, no, it was 32 billion a month ago and zero now. So I don't consider these valuations all that meaningful. And in any event, what happened when you make valuation the real metric, uh, when there's a stock market bubble as it happened in the last uh, year uh, uh, or so, the, the last few years, 
you got extremely hyperinflated valuations and which has started driving that became the principal uh, uh, objective for companies it severely distorts your decision making you are not running the company to benefit customers or even employees for that matter even though you will argue that employees have stock option they benefit from the valuation well they don't you have a lock up periods and what not so employees cannot sell these shares you know even companies that went public with a six month lock up period there wasn't you know enough window of opportunity to sell at those inflated prices prices come down came down quite a bit so in a sense these valuation obsession cost companies uh, dearly in terms of market execution in terms of r and d execution all of that and this is the cost of bubbles in bubbles always uh, cause economic damage long term and we saw this in the startup sector resources got sucked into companies whose only focus was to inflate the paper valuations ftx is a classic classic example of that they sucked in a lot of resources in terms of uh, uh, r and d talent people and the marketing all of that and now it's at zero and this to a lesser extent reflected across the landscape which is also the reason i mean i wanted to stay away from these bubbles I wanted to stay away from the focus on valuation that's also a reason why we stay private you know you speak about employees and the cost to employees shridhar and it is very apparent now what's going on with so many thousands of employees being laid off practically every week or month from the digital universe uh, do you see this becoming even more painful because of the flaw in the business model or flaws in the business model that you just alluded to unfortunately it is the bubble uh, itself right that is uh, cost as well there was a uh, inflated valuations that sucked uh, uh, attracted more and more money into the sector companies went on hiring sprees massively overhired and now inevitably when the bubble turned and it became a crash bust then people lose their jobs so it is a, what was unsustainable became more clear and i am just you know it's just sad to watch this in spectacle but it has already it had happened twice before it had happened in the 2001 uh, to bust and then it again happened in the 2008 9 and all of those times the same exact thing repeated where too much money chased you know um, uh, inflated valuations and there was a big crash and then job losses all of that this time the bubble is appear to be even bigger which is why the bust seems even even uh, worse and i am afraid that the pain has only started i think that this this uh, would get worse before it gets better in the whole tech sector you see companies going belly up uh, being unable to raise uh, venture capital or private equity funding it may not be restricted to just belt tightening it could be even more severe than that uh, if you look at history as a guide the, the best way we can uh, predict the future is to look at the past episodes where similar stuff happen uh, we actually i remember this uh, very distinctly uh, uh, in silicon valley we were exposed to this whole optical networking sector uh, that's where we were serving in uh, 99 2000 that time our primary business was uh, selling software to optical networking companies there were like 400 500 such companies in, in the us at the time silicon valley alone would have maybe 300 such companies two years later just in 2000 all these companies were there and two two years later we 95% of companies had shut down today almost you now only like one or two of them survive and what is interesting about that is that the optical revolution really happened i mean i'm in a remote village and i have uh, dual fiber optic links uh, to my home here so i have two fiber optic lines coming in and uh, in 2000 this was unimaginable that this would happen on a worldwide basis even remote villages in india would have fiber optic connection so the revolution actually happened and similarly wireless revolution happened we have uh, 4g now 5g coming up soon and uh, wireless everywhere everybody has a smartphone in their pocket which was unimaginable again in 2000 so the the premise of the technology revolution was correct yet the companies that were betting on it the venture capital that went into all this that you know eventually that went past this again warren buffett's did you had a, the sector flourished long term but the companies that overextended themselves did not and which were proved to be the vast majority of companies so and and this is the necessary way this, this happens always in these booms and busts the overall premise could be correct the digital transformation all of that would come through 
But that doesn't mean all of the investment dollars that uh, bet on the premise would get actually a return. And I, I offer the optical networking as a classic example, which we were frontally exposed to. And how important is the Indian market for uh, Zoho Corp, uh, Sridhar? Because, you know, a lot of your clients, of course, are spread across the world. Many in, are in America. But just core Indian corporations using your products, how big a market would you say that could be? Yeah, right now, India is uh, number three in terms of market share for us. And uh, in 10 years, it gone, it gone from being barely in the top 10 to now number three. So that just tells you how fast we have grown in India in the last 10 years. In fact, until about 2012, we hardly had any market in India. India was a production base, but we were not actually much of a presence in India in terms of market uh, customers. And today it's number three. And uh, it's also the fastest growing market by far. And I see that we would become number two market for us worldwide in the next three to five years. And it could even be the number one market based on correct current trends over the next 10 years. And that would still mean, I mean, we would still get the majority of revenue from abroad, but by the, the third biggest market today is India, it would be the second biggest in maybe three to five years and the biggest market for us in 10 years. That's how important India is to us. And it also reflects the, the growth of the broader and economy. And which part of your business, sorry, please go ahead. Uh, the, this whole, our growth reflects the broader growth in the Indian economy. We have gone to from, uh, you know, 25 years ago, we were a 350 billion economy. Now it's 10 times bigger, 3.5 trillion economy. And that could become, I, I can easily see the pathway to 10 to 20 trillion economy in the next 10 to 15 years. At this point, a quick break in the show, but we shall return in a minute with Sridhar Vembu, co-founder and CEO of Zoho Corp. They've looked scratchy at times and lost their final group stage match against South Korea. But some quality players in their lineup, coupled with Cristiano Ronaldo's mental toughness, can take them all the way. They are number five on our list of contenders. At number four are the three Lions. They marched into the quarterfinals in some style as they put three goals past Senegal and kept a clean sheet. England have shown great promise as they hope to end a long wait for their second World Cup title. Leo Messi's Argentina are making their presence felt at the FIFA World Cup. And Messi is having his say in it. After a shock loss against Saudi Arabia, Argentina have resurrected their campaign and are well and truly firing on all cylinders. The defending champions are in a league of their own right now and their star boy Kylian Mbappe is tearing up defences for fun. Mbappe for Giroud. With an inform Olivier Giroud alongside him, France are well in contention for a successive World Cup title. And finally, the Samba boys were enjoying life at the moment. Brazil put up a scintillating show in their round of 16 match and look hungry for a record extending 6th title. With Neymar back after recovering from injury and Brazil playing some sublime football, the Samba boys may well go on to become champions. Sports Bureau, India Today. back here watching the Business Today show and I've been in conversation with Sridhar Vembu, uh, the outspoken CEO and co-founder of the billion dollar revenue technology company Soho Corp. Let me ask you a question on the human resource side, uh, you know, because of your work with Zoho University where 
you take in people without fancy uh, degrees, college degrees. Uh, how do you see this problem of employable uh, graduates from India for the technology sector? Because today there seems to be a big scramble for talent, uh, which is why probably issues like moonlighting are coming to the fore. How do you see this problem, I mean, the way around this problem? We have always taken a, a, a work task as skill, capability, building, talent, creation. And a lot of companies, you know, look at talent as something as a given that you get from the market. We see, particularly in the Indian context, the, the challenge is one of creating and nurturing the talent. It's a mindset shift that we are in the talent creation business, we are in the talent nurturing business, not merely just talent acquisition business. So, you know, we don't assume that there's ready made talent available in the market, we just acquire. We go and actively seek to uh, create and nurture the talent. That approach has been true for over 20, no, nearly our entire existence as a company. That has served us really well. In fact, that is critical for both our growth as well as our rural expansion, as well as our employee loyalty. All three are driven by the fact that we invest in talent, we create and nurture the talent, and that, that fuels our uh, growth as a company. And it has actually allowed us to expand uh, by uh, expanding into rural areas with an abundance of latent talent. Talent that is intrinsically there, but someone has to you know, go and nurture it and, and, uh, and then bring it out. And that also promotes employee loyalty because when you invest in people, they tend to be loyal. So all of that has been helped by this uh, all our policy of how we look at talent. Any thoughts on this moonlighting controversy or do you have a specific stance on it? We actually don't, uh, I, you know, it really isn't a problem for us, I haven't really much, I know this didn't arise in the company at all, but really the hard problem in defining all this, if somebody is, for example, a really good software engineer and they run a, a YouTube channel on the side for cooking or YouTube channel focused on uh, organic farming or some such thing, and I, I joke that you know, I am on Twitter talking about macroeconomics. Does that count as moonlighting? <laughs> because what is, what is my interest in macroeconomics, right? So it's very <laughs> difficult to define these things, right? And uh, I mean, I read up a lot about macroeconomics. It informs my work uh, as the CEO of this company, but as well beyond that. I talk about rural uh, development, topics like that. So that's why I think it's really difficult to define this. Our own policy in Zoho is use your common sense. There are some clear, obvious lines. You know, if you're doing some work and then you're going doing the same exact work for the for a competitor and uh, you're getting paid for it, all of that, clearly that is uh, that'd be a violation of trust even. And so that's why it's just say use your common sense. That's the policy. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Sridhar, because you come from fairly modest roots. I mean, you've had a fairly middle class upbringing. You grew up in a household where you're your father was a stenographer in a in the Madras High Court. Uh, I mean, that kind of upbringing. I mean, has it gone a long way in shaping uh, the person that you are at the core? Absolutely. I you know my value systems come from my parents. To this day, my father just turned eighty uh, this last week, and uh, he would refuse any kind of a big celebration of it. I mean, he just went to a temple, you know, conducted a humble puja in a local temple. So that's the type of uh, person my father is and my parents are. And they still retain the exact life they've had you know, well before all of this success, all of that happened. And that is a role model for me. You know, I look at myself much like my father. And uh, I think if you know it's okay for him to live a humble life, why shouldn't I enjoy the same kind of life he does, which is a very modest life. And uh, that was drilled into our head from childhood. I mean, my parents never took on debt, or in my, my father's income was modest, but we never took on debt. As a result, those those values stayed with us, and not just with me, all my siblings. I'm blessed, truly totally blessed to have them as parents because those value system is what has helped me, you know, during all my, this thing, you know, in terms of staying humble, staying close to our roots, and not getting, you know, hyper over excited about wealth itself. To me, wealth only, I, I separate the wealth from a person. I mean, it's, it's not mine in a sense. It allows us to do some good for our society. And I live in a rural area and I, on a daily basis, I may come across a lot of causes that I want to support. 
and that uh, I'm blessed that the wealth allows us to do that. But beyond that, I mean, I'm not really personally interested in uh, wealth because it doesn't make any sense. I'm not the same thing. This is directly from my parents. I would want to be a true uh, son of my parents, and which means that I really cannot be flashily displaying wealth. Then I would cease to be, you know, their son in a way, <laughs> in a core way. So that's why I, I want to live up to their idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you go as far as to say that uh, when you see businessmen uh, with this almost a crude kind of display of wealth, um, building huge mansions, buying ships and yachts and, you know, this public display of wealth, do you find it distasteful too? I don't really want to comment on other people. It's not their business what people want to do with their money. But I'll say there is a, uh, uh, an ancient philosophy in our land, our value system in our land, which, which advises moderation in all things. This is not uh, new. This is, uh, you know, um, uh, thousands of year old wisdom in our land, moderation in all things. So that's the, you know, and, and that helps all of us because we are, in a sense, we are custodians of wealth. Uh, our, our father of the nation, Gandhiji said this. So, you know, he, is, he was never a socialist, right, Gandhiji. But he also said, capitalism, you are a trustee, custodian of wealth. That's how I see it. We have all this wealth, our employees, our society health created. I'm merely a custodian, our, our family, they're all custodians of it. And we get to direct it to good causes. That's how I see it. And uh, an extreme personal display of wealth, at least I, you know, from my upbringing, I find it personally, I cannot do it. That's all. Sridhar, uh, congratulations on your success at Zoho. And I think there's a lot that the Indian digital universe can learn from you and your company but thank you very much for your time and i wish you great success in the years ahead thank you thank you i appreciate it i'm staying